This is an overview of Communities of Practice and Innovation, a service offered by AA K-12 Online for Iowa school districts to help enhance online and blended learning in our K-12 classrooms. Let's first start with the question, what are Communities of Practice? One of the leading researchers, in fact, the person credited with coining the term Communities of Practice is Etienne Wegner. And Etienne Wegner has done some work with Iowa's Community of Practice. His definition states, a community of practice is a group of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and interact regularly to learn how to do it better. Look at those key words. Community of practice is a group of people who share a concern or a passion. And that best defines what we are all about. He identifies several different groups that consist of a community of practice. A community of practice will have a core group dedicated to the overall mission of the community. This group has time and interest invested into the project. And they're supplemented by a group of contributors. These contributors spend quite a bit of time and energy themselves, even though they aren't necessarily ones who have dedicated time. A little further out are collaborators, ones who join in on the conversation and participate. And on the farthest ring are the ones that are called the crowd. They tend to lurk in the community, seeing if it applies to them. Now, you may have heard of a professional learning community, where Richard DeFore. And community practice is slightly different than a professional learning community. Let's talk a little bit about how it's different. First off, as we saw in the definition, a community practice focuses on a passion that the community members share. A professional learning community is driven by data for a specific outcome. Another key difference between the two is that a community practice is usually consisting of people who have a further proximity from each other. Think of it this way. A professional learning community tends to have people in the same building, oftentimes in the same discipline, uh, working with the same set of students. Community practice is bigger, more diffuse, more stretched across the state, so to speak. So its proximity is wider, and therefore it has people meeting with other diverse people. Because of that, a community practice is not set so much around shared goals as a professional learning community. Now, that doesn't mean that a community might not have some goals, but it features much more independence, much more organic uh, thinking and working together. The community thrives in a lot of different ways at the same time. Whereas the professional learning community, they are set on coming up with a shared goal and working towards that goal all in unison. That's not to say that a professional learning community is better than or worse than a community of practice, but it's a different form of professional development. And while we have spent a lot of energy in recent years developing professional learning communities within Iowa schools, we haven't spent as much time developing a statewide community of practice at least until recent years. One other thing I want to mention is a theory called connectivism. And it's by a, a theorist named George Siemens. Connectivism has direct relevance on online communities and why it's important to put them online. Connectivism as a theory states that learning is a, is a set of networked connections. Your brain literally expands by making more connections. And as that neural network gets bigger, you're learning. George Siemens applies what he calls strong connections and weak connections. The strong connections are by connectors that are very close to us, whereas weak connections are further away. Think of this as being a teacher in a classroom. You might learn a lot from your strong connections on a regular basis. It might be the teacher next to you or the students you work every day with. It might be interactions like the, uh, the principal or the district curriculum or the parents that you work with. What's interesting about connectivism is that Siemens um, argues we learn more from our weak connections than our strong connections. Our strong connections tend to be already very similar to us. They reinforce what we already know. 
it's our weak connections, thinking of things outside the box, getting experience with those further away from our own experience that helps push our learning. If you think of that in terms of a community, a professional learning community is set up to learn from those closest working on students that are common. A community of practice works on a diverse group of students and works with a diverse group of teachers as well. Employing George Siemens' connectivism theory, creating an online community gets our teachers in connection with other teachers and allows them to expand those weak connections, which drives new learning. One other concept that Etienne Wagner and others talk about is the idea of social authoring. Social authoring specifically means having many people authoring together. That is, creating common content, common curriculum, common assessments, that type of thing. As teachers, we're always employed in making our own content and assessments and such, our own teaching materials. We do that all the time. Oftentimes we do it in isolation. We'll go ahead and create a quiz or a unit ourselves. Perhaps we've looked at a study guide that a textbook company has made, but we don't get a chance to interact with other teachers on that assessment. A community of practice allows social authoring to happen where you can actually create that quiz together with another teacher teaching the same subject. And together, you and the teacher can push off of each other, can share ideas that maybe you hadn't thought before, and create a better quiz. So let's talk about COPI as far as it relates to online learning. COPI, of course, stands for the Community of Practice and Innovation. And right now, we have set up COPI groups directly looking at the enhancement of online learning in K-12 classrooms. Let's talk about online learning for a second. It's important to set a definition of online learning. Online learning, the definition is where teaching and instruction takes place over the internet. That's outside of the walls of the set hours of the traditional classroom. I can look in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different formats for online learning. But what's key is to remember it's different than what we call digital learning or e-learning where the internet's being used as a resource or a place for learning, but with the face-to-face -face teacher presence in the traditional classroom. We have many classrooms that use computers uh, ubiquitously within them, one-to-one -one classrooms, digitally infused classrooms, and such. They're not really engaged in online learning, though, if the students are still within the four walls of the classroom at the same time that the teacher is. Online learning extends that learning past the confines of the traditional class. It allows learning to take place over a longer period of time, over different sets of time, and outside the walls, even at a distance. Now the concept of blended learning ties into this as well. Blended learning means literally blending the concept of online learning with some of the elements of face-to-face -face learning, taking the best of both. And again, this mix looks different in different formats. There's not just one mix that works for blended learning. In fact, if you had 20 different teachers blending their classroom, I could guarantee you'd probably see 20 different classrooms. So we're focused here in the state on developing online and blended learning. That isn't to say some of our work might not help digital learning in classes that are still meeting face-to-face -face but using technology in them. What it is to say is that we have other initiatives in the state that are working on those. Other groups such as the EdTech Directors, the a new ITIP initiative, and several initiatives that districts are leading themselves. This will dovetail with quite a bit of that, but again, its focus is on blended learning. So let's talk a little bit about its history. This work has not just started this year. In fact, it's now, it, um, this past summer, just finished up a pilot. And the pilot was an extension of the ARA EdTech grant. This pilot consisted of 40 teachers each in the areas of math, science, social studies, and language arts. The initial source of collaboration was a course, an online course that was uh, tweaked and used in a blended setting. Each of the four subjects had a course, three of which were purchased while social studies was created by the group. 
Now, unfortunately, when it comes to grants, funding is always limited, and the end of the funding funding came last September, the September of 2011. And with that, the group's future looked in doubt. We're happy to say that this that the uh, AEAs chose to continue the work and roll that into a new initiative called AEA K-12 Online. Because of that, we're now starting to ramp back up the COPI online learning groups. Let's talk about AEA K-12 Online for a second, because this is a new initiative. AEA K-12 Online is under the same umbrella as AEA PD Online. But instead of providing online professional development, its aim is to enhance online learning in K-12 schools. You'll see this work will dovetail very much with COPI. It has four services that the AEAs are extending to districts. One is that we're looking to extend free, high-quality online content. This is a big barrier for schools. Content can be very expensive and also can take a lot of time to develop yourself. Licenses for products such as Play-Doh or Apex or E2020 can cost a lot of money for a district. If we can provide high quality content for free, it saves money for the district that they can put into teachers and other resources that are more valuable. In addition, we're going to provide professional development for how to teach online. And again, when we're talking about teaching online, that can be in a lot of different formats and include into that blended learning as well. Another service that the AAs offer is assistance with infrastructure and technology. Lots of different ideas here. We offer Moodle hosting across the state. We offer a license for products that allow you to create your own online content, like SoftChalk. And we also provide technology counseling and assistance for local tech directors. And finally, we offer vision and leadership consultation. We'll sit down with local administration to talk about how online learning can fit within their district and to look at things such as policies and communication with stakeholders that will make your implementation a success. Now, how does COPI fit into these four goals? Well, even though the AA K-12 Online has statewide staff allocated to go and deliver these goals, we really see COPI as the better method to bring you about number one and number two. COPI will act as a decision-making group. It will also act as a larger community to make sure that the vision and direction of this is not just solely done by the AEAs, but reflects what LEAs would like as well. What's nice about this partnership is that AEA K-12 Online will supply the human power to go and carry out some of the work that needs to be done. So, for example, if the math community decides we need to, as a community, create an online algebra course, now we'll have an instructional designer from the statewide team to be able to do that. Same thing if the science community says we need to put together a course so that teachers, science teachers know how to teach in a blended classroom. We'll have instructional designers and teachers from AEA K-12 Online be able to offer that type of professional development. So let's look at uh, more closely how COPI will go about its work. And let's revisit Tim Wagner's four-stage model of a community. Let's start with the outside group, the crowd. The crowd is people who are general audience. We mentioned that they were lurkers within the community. They might come to the websites and read forums and posts. They might even attend professional development opportunities and they'll take the content and experiment with it. We all start off as the crowd. Their goals are to become exposed to these new ideas and to see if this applies to them. They also want to see how the community operates. They're kind of dipping their toe in before they make a bigger commitment. One of our goals is to move this group successfully and safely to the next level. The collaborators. Now, collaborators are slightly different than our crowd. They're more involved in conversation and community activity. In forums, they will add their own posts and their own thoughts and replies to other people. The research that Tian Wagner and others have done have identified 30% as a nice ideal number for a thriving community. 
we have 30 percent of our uh, of our participants in a community as collaborators it shows we've got a good mix and a good amount of involvement now remember people at this stage it's not a formal commitment they're self-selecting their involvement level as we said this group is asking questions they're even suggesting ideas and uh, they're giving encouragement and feedback their outcomes now that they've decided this community does have application for them is they want to increase their understanding their own confidence as a teacher and they want to share their opinion so just as we as a community want to move the crowd into becoming collaborators we also want to move some collaborators to our next group that's more of a leadership group we call the contributors now the contributors are more are, are our informal leaders Again, the research says that about 10% of your total community would ideally be contributors. Now, this group still might not have dedicated time to do on the work. They might not have time set aside in their schedule by their principal or their supervisor. But they certainly are spending a lot of time on their own time. These, these uh, behaviors are more leadership quality. They develop content and professional development that contributes directly to the community. They're sharing that with the groups. They're not only contributing to conversation, they're actually facilitating it, putting their own original posts, elaborating on other comments as examples. And they're participating in that community vision planning. The outcomes here extend beyond what a collaborator would do. They want to publish their own personal content not just for their own sake, but to get feedback from a larger audience on it. And they want to contribute to that larger knowledge base. It's not just about them and their classroom. They want to see it have an effect in classrooms across the state. Many of them have a lot of new ideas that they want to try out, and this provides them an opportunity to do that and again, a safe format. Now at the very center, we have our core. And think of a core as a steering committee. The core is a very small group of people, and it's small on intention. It's very hard to pull together a very large group and have them all focused around the same vision. This core group would be subject matter experts. It might be at the AEA level, the DE level, Iowa Learning Online teachers, or uh, LEA teachers. We'd look to about five to seven members with dedicated time. And that's going to include an AAPD online instruction designer who's embedded with that group to help put in, in, in play some of the decisions that they make. Again, this group is your formal leadership, and we said that they meet regularly to act as a steering committee. They're going to make decisions that revolve around the uh, community direction and the vision. That will include decisions around both professional development and content. They're going to set up projects. They'll also evaluate the community's effectiveness and see if they're making progress They'll be in charge of vetting contributions to make sure they're of quality and worth sharing to others, and they'll facilitate activity. This group is not as much focused on their own learning as it is on developing that vibrant, self-sustaining community, making it an impact in statewide student achievement. So, let's take a look at what the core steering group is setting out to do. We mentioned there are two items. The first one is to oversee content. And content is a large area. We need to further break that down a little bit. When you talk about online or blended content, it could mean a full online course or full blended course, but it also could mean smaller components. It could be individual modules that are used for credit recovery. It could be a smaller unit. It could be an individual learning object or resource. Now, the term learning object is an important one to know. That means any bite-sized item that exists within a course. And that's kind of a catch-all phrase. It can include online lessons, simulations, assessments, articles, flex books. There are a lot of different things that would fall into that category. These content types can also come from many sources. When we might buy some of this content, some of it might be open source and freely available. Think of things like the Khan Academy as a source of uh, content that's been created and be available for teachers to use. It could be something that we do uh, develop statewide. We might get our core group together 
and as a group make an online algebra course or an online biology course. Or it could be something that a member of the community that contributes. You could have a teacher out in a district create that algebra course and share it and it's taken by another algebra teacher and refined and those additions are given back to the community. So there's a lot of places we can get these different content and there's a lot of different types of content we can get. One of the goals of the core steering group will be to make decisions about what content is needed to do so in a diverse way so it covers a lot of different areas and to make sure we vet content for quality. So that's area number one. Area number two is that they'll oversee professional development. And that also is a large area when it comes to this work. Let's talk about how we can break that down. We use three terms, formal, informal, and non-formal to describe professional development opportunities. Formal PD opportunities are things with set outcomes and usually they'll have credit attached to them. There might be things like our OLLI courses or our new MOLLI courses, such as our new MOLLI course in blended learning, which teaches teachers how to teach in a blended learning classroom. Another, idea, uh, another item that's by, been identified are foundational pieces that will help people ramp up into this work. We have some content around the Iowa Core investigations, and we're also creating content around conceptual-based teaching. And finally, and we'll talk more about this in a little bit, the idea of online seminars around content that the community is providing. Now, informal professional development might not have set outcomes. It might not have uh, set, uh, credit attached to it. And it might not be in a structured format. It might be something that can be applied in a more informal basis. But that doesn't mean that learning is any less in this situation. There are many opportunities for informal professional development. Groups can conduct webinars. Consider a Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock session where teachers from across the state can log on and view each other's ideas in a sharing opportunity or perhaps a roundtable discussion. Those same type of discussions could take place through threaded discussions online or through sharing repositories on a site. Similarly, there could be meetups at statewide conferences or some uh, occasional face-to-face -face sessions as well. And finally, there's this layer of non-formal professional development it's to create chatter and other buzz around the topic. One of the exa best examples is by using Twitter feeds and hashtags for the sharing of ideas. And just like with content, the Core Steering Committee will oversee professional development. They'll look at prioritizing what areas are important. They'll look at setting up those professional development opportunities, going out and recruiting instructors or facilitators, whatever the case may be. And their goal is to have a wide variety of professional development opportunities to meet all our needs. And before we move on, we should talk about what are the set of deliverables. Specifically, if you're a part of COPI, what are you going to get? Well, there's five basic ones that we want to start off with this year. We might be adding to this as we go on. One is we're going to have that central repository of content. Basically, the content of the community It will be placed in one location. And even as I say that, it'll probably be placed in two. It'll probably be placed on our statewide Moodle server, the resource Iowa server as it is. And it'll also be placed in a new searchable database called Aquella. Aquella is a product that we're hoping to have implemented and rolled out in the spring of 2013 and fully ready for teachers at the start of next school year. There will also be a sharing area for teachers, so not only can they get content from the repository, but they can share back their products and their ideas with other teachers. We mentioned already the discussion board for ongoing community discussion. And that will be facilitated by statewide facilitators. We briefly mentioned the idea of a seminar. A seminar is a loosely structured professional development opportunity that's designed around a specific area of content. For example, one seminar that we're looking at in the spring of 2013 in the English Language Arts COPI group 
is around the new poetry module that's been created. Our plans are to have a group of English language arts teachers go through as a cohort through this seminar. They'll have a chance to be a student, or at least see the, uh, the online poetry model from the perspective of a student. Then they'll have the chance to turn around and offer it as a teacher. They'll be able to uh, apply it to their classroom. And then they'll be able to take their student uh, um, work and their reflections from teaching and share those with the larger community. One big application of this is when taking student work to be able to calibrate it, to be able to share with other teachers to say, I got this type of student work, is this what you're getting there too? And if not, to troubleshoot and see why the different discrepancy. We're really excited about the idea of seminars. We'd like to offer a different seminar in each of our Copi groups every semester. And AAP Online offers semesters in the spring, which is January through April, the summer, which is May through August, and the fall, which is September through December. If they're highly successful, it might offer more than one in each group. And finally, we're offering MOLLE courses. MOLLE stands for more online learning for Iowa educators. They're going to be a series of courses that expand off the original OLLI series. And our first course in that sequence is on blended learning in the, in the classroom. And that gives you an idea of what COPI is and what we're set off to do. Let's talk right now and we'll finish up our presentation but mentioning what we are currently working on, because it still is a work in progress. We have some next steps. We're in the process of recruiting a core of individuals in all four of those areas. Remember, we're looking for the five to seven teachers represented from AEAs, LEAs, the Department of Education, and Iowa Learning Online. Those core groups are meeting, or have already met, and they're establishing procedures, such as when they're going to meet, and how, and, and such. While that's off to a good start, we've got a couple of workflows that we need to work on. One of the workflows is how to take content and then share it. And consider this, if a teacher A has created a unit, let's say it's a nonfiction unit, how do they mark down that they want to share this with the rest of the community? How does teacher B know that it's being shared? Once they know it, how do they actually go in and look at it? And then finally, how do they request and get that content to use in their own classroom? And as most important, how do they then give reflective feedback back to teacher A? That's the workflow that we're working through. Another workflow is the ramp up involvement. This means how do teachers become uh, more skilled and more ready to participate in this community of practice? We mentioned there's some foundational pieces that are going to be key, and we also want some mentoring activities to help teachers who are brand new to teaching in the blended classroom. One of the issues that's really important for our core committee, since they have dedicated time, is to talk about funding and repayment for their time spent. And that's an ongoing discussion with the AEAs. Another step that we're working on is what we have entitled the Agora. Agora is just a code name to talk about the work. It means simply a meeting place or a marketplace in ancient Greek culture. In our uh, application, what we're talking about here is the virtual online space. Where do people come? What's the website they get into in order to have this community? Where are the sharing and the discussion boards found? That's some work we are developing right now. We're looking at lining up our spring seminars, not just picking the topics and marketing them, but also building them as well. And finally, and very important, we need to interface this with other initiatives. I mentioned that there's other work going on in the state around digital learning, around Iowa core work and other things like that. Consider the new group ITIP, which is looking at technology, innovation, and integration, especially in one-to-one -one school districts. I'm working with the ed tech uh, uh, consultants across the state, our media directors, and Iowa AEA Online, who has digital resources that they use in a face-to-face -face classroom, also blends into this work. There's a lot of work to be done in this area. 
And that does it. That's a look at Iowa Copi, Copi Online, and where we're at right now. We encourage feedback from uh, this presentation as well as your other thoughts. Please, please feel free to contact me, Evan Abbey, at eabbey at aea11.k12.ia.us or Nancy Mobile, our online K-12 specialist, at nmobile, that's n-m-o-v-a-l-l, -L, at ghaea.org.